Hello everyone. Let's welcome Brendan Collins to deliver a talk on who said wrangling geospatial data at scale was easy. Over to you, Brendan. Huge thanks to the PyCon uh, 2022 uh, organizers for making this event happen. Super excited to be here. This is my first PyCon. Um, also, you know, my first PyCon presentation, obviously. Um, also, uh, huge thanks to Chris Skiner from the Nature Conservancy who loaned me his Python for Dummies book in 2008 and was super patient with me as I struggled through writing some of my first Python functions. Um, I learned about geospatial data and the power of uh, bringing spatial thinking to organizations while working at a company called Blue Raster, which was uh, using geospatial data for um, helping conservation groups better achieve their goals. I'm, I've built a career on geospatial data off of the work of a lot of other people. So huge thanks also to Peter Wang and Travis Oliphant, Matt Rockland, who's here, and also Brian Vandevin, folks that have mentored me and helped me and also shown me that there are business models that don't involve locking important tools behind proprietary licenses and keys. So uh, big, big thanks to those folks. I wanted to start off by showing a, um, an example of a uh, vertical scaling solution for geospatial data. What we're looking at is Crater Lake National Park. And as I click around the map, I'm generating a view shed or a line of sight analysis on this terrain. While I'm rotating the position of the sun to do ray tracing in a hill shade, this was made possible through using a, a CUDA-enabled GPU that was all written from a library called X-Array Spatial, which we maintain at MakePath. Um, and it's an example of taking a small amount of data and making a, what is a somewhat computationally intensive task fast using a GPU. In this talk, uh, I'm going to be presenting really a grab bag of different tools that you should be aware of if you're approaching geospatial analytics in Python. My name is Brennan Collins. Um, I've been involved in open source geo for about 10 years. I uh, am the maintainer of X-Array Spatial, which is a raster-based spatial analytics library. Um, I'm also a huge fan of Data Shader, which is a general purpose rasterization pipeline. We're gonna be talking a little bit about Data Shader. I'm also the author of the King JSON Bible down there at the bottom left for anyone that's interested in doing NLP on the Bible. Um, and uh, also a new package from MakePath called MapShader, which is trying to make GIS web services easy from Python. Um, I'm the co-founder of MakePath, which is an Austin-based spatial analytics firm. Um, we are focused on bringing the broader tools from the data science ecosystem to geospatial professionals and the clients that we work with. A lot of times, tools from general data science are not named in ways that GIS analysts and geospatial data scientists recognize, and we're trying to bridge that gap while also providing services to clients. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about MakePath, please visit our blog, and you can see a blog post on this GPU-enhanced geospatial analysis with the Greater Lake National Park that I just showed. And you can see a little bit more of what went into creating that. So um, who said that processing geospatial data at scale was easy? Well, maybe it was Sophia Yang. I don't know if you know her. She's a senior data, science, uh, data scientist at Anaconda. She just started a YouTube channel and uh, has some really great content on there that she shows a lot of her secrets for data science. So maybe it was Sophia Yang. Um, also, Natalie O'Dell here, who is a, a GIS analyst at MakePath. Um, Dan, Natalie, do you think that processing geospatial data at scale is easy? Sometimes. Sometimes, cool. So Natalie is the author of a, of a really interesting library called Census Parquet. And what Census Parquet is doing is it's taking the Census 2020 um, geographic files, shape files, and converting them into a format that's better for processing at a large scale, which is Parquet. So this is not exactly the Parquet files themselves, but the tools to create those Parquet files. So you can go to Census Parquet and download this, and you can modify these scripts for other uses. But we took this and we processed 
the census 2020 data so that it would be easy to consume from big data systems like Dask and Spark and other, other solutions. Now, one of the things that makes um, processing geospatial data difficult is that uh, there's a lot of different formats. So as we go over to OGC, the Open Geospatial Consortium, we can see a list of the OGC standards, which they currently support, and there's a bunch of them. They uh, apply to, a, to many different types of data, and it can be a little overwhelming if you're getting involved in this to choose which data formats should I be targeting. So th this talk, I hope that you leave this talk with a, a good idea of the formats and tools that you should be using for different types of geospatial data. These data formats are really divided up into two general categories. One of those are for vector data, and another is for raster data. In looking at uh, datacarpentry.org, which is a great site to learn more about um, uh, data science, you can see uh, a little bit of an introduction to vector data. So vector is a very overloaded term in data science, but in GIS and geospatial, it refers to points, lines, and polygons. So vector data represents discrete phenomena. So if we think of a uh, building, then that building could be represented as a point, it could be represented as a line, as the outline of the building footprint, or it could be represented as a polygon. Those are all uh, vector formats. So vector are for discrete phenomena. Um, some of the tools to handle vector data, points, lines, and polygons that we should think about, um, start with a library called Pandas, which many of you are familiar with, that gives us the ability to manipulate tabular data in Python and organize NumPy arrays with labels. Now, um, another library came out called GeoPandas, and GeoPandas will add a geometry column to your pandas data frames so that you can process vector data with a similar API to pandas. So uh, GeoPandas is great, and just like pandas, it's an in-memory data structure that you're working with. So another library on the vector side that I just wanted to talk about was Dask GeoPandas. So the Dask data frame which is a really great abstraction for scaling pandas data frames to multiple threads or multiple cores or multiple machines, also has this extension Dask GeoPandas to give you that geometry column on your Dask data frame so that you can use the Dask abstractions with GeoPandas. This is a fairly new library. It's, um, I would say, like, has some rough edges, but they're getting smoothed out. And it's a really great dependency if you're going to process vector data sets do, that do not fit on a single machine. So as we processed uh, Census Parquet and, and, and Natalie was writing those scripts, we used Dask GeoPandas to load up each one of, of the individual census files into a single large data frame that we could then save out as, partitioned, uh, as a partitioned Parquet file. So I really, I'm gonna mention Parquet a lot, and I, I think th the first takeaway from this in processing geospatial data at scale is that Parquet is, is a really good friend. Um, OGC is now putting out a GeoParquet specification for having that geometry in your Parquet file. And there's a couple of reasons why you're gonna want to use Parquet as a format. So the, uh, the first reason that you're gonna wanna use Parquet as a format is because it's binary right, instead of a text-based format. It supports uh, a wide number of compression uh, t formats, and it also um, stores data by column, and that's really nice, and it's partitionable. So those four things together make Parquet a really good option for storing your data. And we know that performance is, breaks down into two different things. It breaks down into memory and I.O., right, or uh, compute and I.O., excuse me. So Parquet is going to handle the I.O. component of scaling, and as long as we have a, a geometry column in our Parquet file, then we'll be able to scale vector operations on top of, uh, on top of the data. So the, the first lesson in scaling would be choose a data format that lends itself to fast I.O. So it should be binary, it should support various types of compression, it should be most likely a column or store, so you don't have to load all of your data into memory if you're only interested in one column. 
Um, and it should also be partitionable so that you can have individual processes or workers load in one partition as opposed to having to load the entire data set. Now, the other area of spatial data is raster data. Raster data is regular grids. We know rasters from formats like JPEGs and PNGs. They're images. So raster formats in the geospatial world are used to rep represent mostly continuous phenomena. So if you think of, of uh, rainfall, um, soil types is a, is a common one, elevation, uh, those are all, tend to be represented as rasters. Um, and a, a fun, uh, you know, little uh, cliche comment from the geospatial world, we say, raster is faster and vector is corrector. So a lot of times in performance, the, the performance gains can be found by making sure that you're using the correct formats for your data. If you take a large elevation data set and you convert it into a vector from a raster, you can do that but you're gonna end up with very complicated vectors. So many vertices um, for each one of your areas. And as you process that, it's gonna be fairly slow. Now, raster um, data has its own issues. And we're gonna talk about a couple of libraries that are gonna help you. The foundational library, which we all know and love, is NumPy, which gives us the ability to allocate a, a typed array that um, is much faster to work with than, say, a, Python, a heterogeneous Python list, where we're doing all the type checking for every element. So NumPy forms the foundation for the geospatial libraries for raster processing that come after. But there are some things about NumPy that can be difficult. So um, one of them is not having labels. So when you're using a NumPy array, you'll find that you do a lot of integer indexing with the NumPy array slicing syntax. And it would be really nice if you could build a, say, a cube, let's think about a 3D array, where you have X and Y as your geospatial coordinates, and maybe Z as your different layers. Those could be um, maybe the bands of a Landsat image, or they could be um, different, you know, uh, different data sets from places that have been co-registered. X array will give you the ability to label those dimensions and refer to those dimensions um, with strings instead of integers. That makes your code a lot more readable, and in three months when you come back to a, uh, a function, you'll be able to, to understand what it's doing. There's um, a lot of work has gone into X-Array, and uh, we owe at MakePath a huge credit to the Pangeo community for, for pushing forward the X-Array format and other formats like Czar that, that we uh, also rely on for raster data. MakePath um, decided that there could be more universal functions on top of X-Array objects. So we created a library called X-Array Spatial, which includes spatial extensions for X-Array objects. This library does not introduce any new data structures. All it is is a set of really the universal functions. So if we think of NumPy really as two things, the ND array plus universal functions like sum and standard deviation that, that operate on top of um, uh, the NumPy array, X-Array Spatial is basically like spatial ufunks, which take X-Array data arrays as input and tend to return X-Array data arrays as output. There's a couple of functions which return pandas uh, um, data frames, and we can, we can see a couple of those. But we have a nice list of the features that are in X-Array Spatial, if you scroll down a little bit, and we can see some of the, the, the categories of universal functions that we support. So, um, classifying or binning rasters where you want to bin um, using like an equal interval method on top of a raster. Um, focal analytics where we're looking at neighborhoods around pixels, um, similar to, you know, convolution filters, but uh, we have a general apply so that you can create your own filters to pass over an image. Hotspot analysis to identify st statistically significant hotspots in an image. Um, statistics. So multispectral functions, these are all about combinations of different bands and imagery. So if you get a Landsat scene or a Sentinel scene, you'll have RGB bands, but then also um, near infrared and uh, a slew of other bands. You can combine those together to pull out interesting information. Um, the classic one in multispectral would be NDVI. I'm just going to try to make this uh, so folks can see. But there's a bunch of other ones. Now, as I look through these features, you'll notice that there's different columns here. 
So these different columns correspond to which array backends are supported by the function. Um, so the, the NumPy um, XArray data array, so XArray is wrapping a NumPy array to provide labels, right? But it can wrap other types of arrays. So uh, it can also wrap Dask arrays. So if you're loading up a chunked array using Dask, you can still use those XArray labels, but the underlying data is a Dask array instead of just a NumPy array. There are also CuPy arrays. So CuPy provides a NumPy-like API on top of CUDA GPUs. So that's really handy. Um, you can put a CuPy array inside of an XArray data array and then run it through XArray spatial functions, and that's nice. And then there's also the Dask GPU column. So that would be, correspond to a cluster of GPUs that you're, uh, you're running an analysis on. We have some simple pathfinding on top of rasters. Also proximity analysis, so we're looking at the distance from um, target pixels in a couple of different ways. There's um, allocation direction and uh, just, just distance, which is the proximity function, and those currently only work on NumPy and Dask arrays. We're still implementing the, the CuPy uh, versions. Some raster to vector tools and classic surface tools, like doing slope and um, curvature. Uh, Viewshed is, is one of them here that I showed, showed earlier. So we have vector and we have raster. So data shader is a great tool which came out of Anaconda, really led by uh, Jim Bednar and Jim Christ. And what this is is a general purpose rasterization pipeline. So by that I mean moving from vector data to raster data. So what if you're dealing with elevation data and you're also dealing with parcel data? Parcels, say the boundaries of a given property in a community, um, are best represented as vectors, while ele 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 elevation is best represented as a raster, Data Shader will allow you to convert between the two in an intelligent way, and it also allows you to specify aggregation functions for dealing with things like overplotting. And uh, so, so Data Shader is a, is a really amazing tool. We use it all the time at MakePath, and we can see an example here of um, population in the United States of so the lower 48. And this is one point per pixel in the country. So this is a vector data set of points. And Data Shader is taking it and aggregating it to, the, to different pixels and then applying a, a function to reduce those values into a color here. Um, there's a, a log color ramp applied, so we're able to resolve the Midwest cities and not get drowned out by New York, Houston, and Chicago, and Los Angeles. But Data Shader is one of those tools you want in your toolbox so that you can convert from vector to raster easily um, and co-register data sets. And by co-register, I mean having their pixels aligned. So if I load up, say, my elevation data, and then I want to bring in parcel data and summarize the elevation by the parcels, right? I'm going to have to convert those parcels into a raster, but I'm going to need their pixels to align. And that's where Data Shader can help you by helping you resample the elevation data, rasterize the vector data, bring them together, and allow you to do your analysis without worrying about those creativity killing steps. Um, now, in scaling, there's, also, there's some other dependencies that, that need to be highlighted here. Um, Numba is certainly one of them. In X-ray spatial, we're, we have heavy use of Numba for vertical scaling. And by vertical scaling, I mean making our algorithms faster. I want to stay in Python. I don't want to drop down to a C extension when I need to loop through a bunch of pixels. And so the number functions inside of X-ray spatial, I hope to get to, to showing you one of them, um, uh, make it possible to have performant code without adding a C extension. Um, and on the horizontal scaling, um, Dask is the solution for being able to scale out to multiple threads and multiple CPUs. It understands number functions to send around to workers, and so these tools integrate very nicely. I mentioned CuPy. Um, CuPy is for interfacing with um, CUDA GPUs with a NumPy-like syntax. And um, here's a recent uh, merge that we had on, on X-Array Spatial where uh, Twee, one of the engineers, says, um, current hotspots CuPy case implementation uh, runs on pure CuPy. Enabling Numba helps greatly improve performance. Um, in you know, testing this array size, we got a 6,000x uh, performance increase, right? So that was, a, that was an example where there's probably like a lot of low-hanging fruit to do on, on the hotspots tool. 
and using Numba and its JIT decorator for, for CUDA, we were able to target GPUs for hotspots and get a really nice improvement. Um, I also wanted to highlight the planetary computer from Microsoft. Uh, the planetary computer combines curated data sets with scalable compute on Jupyter Lab and open source tools like Dask and Numba. And um, looking at a quick example here, we can see pulling in um, elevation data from the planetary computer and doing a nominal analysis on it. So what I'm doing is I'm uh, importing data shader. Um, I'm importing a, a planetary computer uh, library and X-ray, choosing some areas of interest, and then using a, what is a stack catalog to access data. Stack is a great open source specification. It's uh, spatiotemporal asset catalogs for being able to have a JSON file which you can read, which describes a multi-part raster data set. So if you have a large, uh, say you have Landsat and there's many scenes, you don't wanna loop through every scene and check its bounds to see whether it's in your study area or not. You wanna consult an index. And that's what Stack is. It's an index that you can put in S3 along with some other formats and read that Stack catalog and find the data that you're interested in. So we've queried this Stack catalog, um, uh, the NASA DEM, for our area of interest. We're retrieving that elevation. Then we're able to grab that data and use data shader to uh, an X-ray spatial. So here we're computing a hill shade with X-ray spatial and then um, color mapping with a pseudo elevation color map. Um, and so this was querying a very large data set, but it used Stack to figure out what area of the data to pull. It then used X-Array to open that data set and uh, resample it. it. Used X-Array Spatial to compute a hill shade to place a light source at a given location in azimuth. And then it used Data Shader at the end to uh, actually add color mapping to the array. So what this is, is this is, you know, if you're interacting with this, this is an X-Array data array. So Stack, I mentioned a little bit about Stack, so check Stack out. There's a lot of great tools around Stack. Stack is not Python specific, it's simply a specification, but there's PyStack and other libraries that implement it. Um, and X-Array Spatial um, has a whole user guide where you can look at um, the different tools in action. So this is a proximity notebook where we're looking through um, calculating proximity on, uh, um, on points. So we have our starting points and we're able to run the um, X-ray spatial proximity tool to generate a grid where every pixel is the value in distance to the nearest point. And you can choose different distance metrics. Um, you can also um, do this uh, where you are, say, doing the distance from a line feature. And here's the uh, result of a line feature. You can threshold that distance. You can also do um, proximity allocation and direction where I want the value not to be the distance to the nearest item, I want it to be the ID of the nearest item. And that's what allocation is. And so that is an allocation grid. And then um, also direction where you want the, say the cardinal direction to the uh, nearest point. So those are some tools available in X-ray spatial. Um, we do have a, a continued CUDA working group where we're working on algorithms. I mentioned the um, hotspots tool. And I wanted to quickly show, I just have a little time left, what it's like inside the code of X-Array Spatial looking at these number functions. So here is the code for slope, but um, I'm just gonna quickly change this to hillshade because we saw um, more of the hillshade uh, demos here. So we have first a uh, NumPy implementation of hillshade, um, fairly, just using uh, NumPy ufuncs, great. We can take that NumPy version of our, our Hillshade, and we can scale it to using Dask. Look how easy Dask is. So we're, uh, there is an edge case here where we have to handle overlapping partitions. Because our data is spread out, we can use map overlaps. So we can pull in the edge pixels from one partition and the edge from another, so we can compute our Hillshade and not have um, uh, edge effects for every partition of our, of our raster. We can then sprinkle on the CUDA JIT decorator and we've enabled this code for GPUs. 
Um, the, uh, so in this file here, it's, it's about 200 lines with uh, some documentation. It's handling the NumPy case, the Dask case, the GPU case, and the Dask GPU case, all in 200 lines of code without any C extensions, and it's very performant. So check out X-Ray Spatial and at a minimum steal functions from it and look at, uh, look at examples of implementing Numba and Dask together. Um, uh, in general, I just, you know, I'm just so grateful to be here. Uh, it's an amazing opportunity to interface with the Python community, and I urge folks to reach out uh, to me and to, to other people at MakePath. Um, I always enjoy going and uh, evangelizing these tools and helping organizations to use them. And um, I think we're not doing any, any Q&A, but um, thank you guys so much for the opportunity and hope to see you around the conference. <laughs>